चलो फिर से आज वो नजारा याद कर ले शहीदों के दिलों की वो ज्वाला याद कर ले जिसमें बहकर आजादी पहुंची थी किनारे पर तेज भक्तों के रक्त की वो धारा याद कर ले अ वेरी प्रेजेंट मॉर्निंग टू एवरी प्रेजेंट हियर आई एम पी हर्षवर्धन एंड ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द पोलिटिकल साइंस एसोसिएशन आई प्राउडली वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस वेबिनार कोमेमोरेटिंग मार्टर्स डे मार्टर्स डे more popularly known as shahid divas marks the death anniversary of mahatma gandhi who was assassinated on this day today as we celebrate azadi ka amrit mahotsav we have gathered here to pay homage to the brave hearts of this nation who sacrificed their lives in the line of duty to protect the sovereignty of this nation the flame of a lamp removes the darkness of ignorance and spreads the luminescence of knowledge hence we light the lamp in reverence to knowledge as the greatest wealth so it start the event by a virtual lighting of the lamp hankuram kalyanam arogyam jana sampada shubham purutvam kalyanam arogyam jana sampada shatru buddhi vinashaya deepan chotin namo sute now i would like to call upon the head of the political science department dr jita mishra ma'am to kindly address the gathering and welcome our respected speaker for the day colonel dr vijay chenji ji and formally inaugurate the webinar respected speaker colonel dr vijay chenji ji dear students esteemed colleagues on behalf of the department of political science i welcome you to the webinar on the martyrs day we have organized this small event to commemorate and honor the brave hearts who have sacrificed their lives for the country martyrs day or shaheed divas is a tribute to the freedom fighters some people live for themselves some for others and very few for the nation and mankind on 30 january mahatma gandhi the father of the nation was assassinated by and during his prayers by nathuram godse mahatma gandhi was a great saint a great patriot and a freedom fighter after his death jawahar nehru said the light has gone out of a life but light has not gone it still shines and it affects so many people and shows direction to so many judith brown aptly said that gandhi led the indian people through many ups and downs to the ultimate goal of liberty he tried to bring independence in a non violent manner that too through the method of satyagraha on martyrs day people pay tribute to the people who lost their lives for the sake of the country on occasion of the martyrs day we have with us colonel no vijay chengi who is an expert in northeast sir the students would like to hear about the unsung martyrs of the northeast who played a pivotal role during the freedom movement and in contemporary times who have not received much recognition sir we are happy to have you here you have taken some time out of your busy schedule to speak to the students i'm sure they will gain so much from this discussion and this webinar uh, thank you thank you so much ma'am we are privileged to have your support with us every time due to some prior commitments our principal ma'am professor c sheela reddy couldn't join us today but she has conveyed her blessings now with immense pride and gratitude i would introduce our speaker for the day colonel dr vijay chenji ji 
Dr. Vijay Ji is an alumnus of the National Defence Academy, Khadakwasla, Pune. He serves as the president of the Indus International Research Foundation. He saw action on the Western Front during the Bangladesh War of 1971. He has served in the Northeast, in Ladakh, in the Sikkim Heights, and also in the deserts of Rajasthan. He received the Army Chief's Commendation Card for his bravery while combating insurgency in the Northeast. He has a master's degree in ancient history. He also has an MPhil degree and a PhD. Apart from this, Dr. Vijay is also a well-read Sanskrit scholar. He has been a student of Advait Vedanta and has been studying Vedas and Upanishads. Colonel Vijay Ji has traveled widely and has visited over two dozen countries, including the US, the UK, and prominent European countries. He has authored two books and has published many research papers. Sir, I now invite you to enlighten us with your insightful words. Uh, good morning to you all. I hope I'm audible. Yes, sir, you, yes, are sir, audible. you are perfectly audible. Okay, thank you. Greetings to you all. And uh, at the outset, the thank you very much to one and all for the gracious invite you all extended to me. Uh, I begin with a word of thanks to uh, Professor Sheila Rediji, who's uh, and told the principal. Uh, also to Professor Deepika Singh, who is the HOD of Political Science Department, and uh, Dr. Vaifaya, who is a faculty member, and all the students of uh, Sri Venteshwara College of Delhi University um, for giving me this opportunity uh, of speaking to you. Uh, before I proceed further, I would like to congratulate uh, you all for this Diamond Jubilee celebrations. It's a, a milestone, it's a great event, and uh, the kind of work your education, uh, your educational institution has done, a very reputed one. I remember when I was in Delhi in the early 80s, uh, it, it, it was still new, but then uh, it was very difficult getting a seat into this college. I think you're all fortunate ones. We can go on to the next slide. If I'm audible, I'll request whoever is uh, controlling the, you can go on to the next slide. Yeah. This you're all familiar with uh, on the Dawla Kuma, you know, when you go on to that Sardar Patel Mag, uh, the Tal Katora Stadium, after that you find this famous, there's a Dandi Mask depiction, which is just to put things in, uh, in the perspective. Next one. Yeah, uh, the today's topic is Martyr's Day. It's a well-known topic uh, and very popular, but uh, the least understood. And especially off late, there has been a lot of uh, discussions, debates, and a bit of controversy too. Uh, the reason is very simple. Uh, Martyrs Day has always been associated with, uh, you know, sacrifice of uh, Jawans, sacrifice of soldiers for the nation, not just the soldiers, even the civilians, some of these freedom fighters uh, and all that. But behind that, since some of you are budding scholars and you know who, who are all uh, getting into the you, you could be lawmakers and professors and so on so you need to understand normally i don't cover this it's slightly controversial but i thought i must think, put, a, put things in perspective before we proceed now what exactly is martyrdom now martyrdom the history of martyrdom is different in different cultures and I will take up broadly the Abrahamic culture the, in Christianity, then in Islam, and a bit of it in Hinduism. Now, martyrdom, the concept of martyrdom in Christianity, it dates back to the time when Christianity was still taking roots in Europe. And then at that time, the Romans and the, the pagans, you know, uh, they would kill any person 
who did not uh, believe in uh, denouncing his faith. In other words, a person who did not accept uh, giving up Christianity, he would be killed. So he was termed a martyr. And this word martyr has been taken from the Greek word witness. It means these people were the witness to the life and the crucifixion and also the resurrection of Christ. And they would refuse to give up their faith. So they were termed as martyrs because they were witnesses. Now the same uh, logic more or less uh, Islam, Islam too. Now Islam, they don't consider logic. They say it is uh, it's shaheed. Now shaheed is an Arabic word. And shaheed more or less means the same. The literal meaning of shaheed, the epitomology of shaheed is, uh, is a witness again. And here, anybody who fights and dies for, the law, for his faith voluntarily is called a martyr. You can go on to the next slide. This is already covered in Greek and Western uh, thing. Martyr is a witness. In Arabic, it is shaheed. Shaheed, one who upholds the cause of his religion. But in uh, Sanatan Dharma or in Hinduism, there is no word equivalent uh, for martyrdom. Because uh, at that time, when Sanatan Dharma was there, there was no other religion. You know, because uh, as the oldest religion of more than 5,000 years, uh, so there is no question of somebody fighting and dying for his particular faith because there, there was no alternate faith. Uh, but uh, but uh, these days they call it Sarwat. I did not know it till recently. And there are so many names. But this word, uh, the Martyr's Day has come to stuck by more of a, uh, you know, the popular culture. It is there in the popular culture. And then, uh, see, despite the promotion of ahimsa within Sanatana Dharma, there is no concept of martyrdom. It is a belief of the righteous duty. That means you, are, uh, you do what is evil and what is good. You have it in Ramayana, the good and the evil. You have it in Mahabharata. And so also in a lot of our uh, ancient uh, texts, scriptures where violence is used as a last resort for resolution of all means and all other means are failed. Examples of this are found in Mahabharata. Now, if you see in Mahabharata, Sri Krishna, he, he, he is when he is uh, enlightening Arjuna. In the second chapter, I think it is 37 words. He says, Hatava Prapsasi Mokhargha Jitva Jitvava Bhokshasi Mahi. Uh, now it is very simple. What he is saying is, if you die in a battle, you will attain uh, heaven. You, you know, you will go to heaven where you will enjoy everything. And if you live on, then you have all the pleasures of living on the earth. So either way, you are a winner. Now that is the, the concept in Hinduism. I won't go too much deep into that because it's not so very relevant to the thing. But I thought I'll just put this as a foundation because in future you should know that this martyrdom is more of a religious concept than something which is national. Next one. Yeah. This is just to break the monotony. It is to revive the spirit of the independence movement. Again, a depiction of Gandhi Mahat. Now, what is the modern uh, day phenomenon of a secular state? In a secular state, basically a secular state that which is uh, free of any religious intervention in the in governance. And uh, in martyrdom in different countries are a little different. In Hungary is different. Some of the European, European countries have a different understanding of it. It is more of a to fight for the nation. Uh, I, I'll give you an example how this martyrdom thing, uh, you know, became very popular. It was when uh, Abraham Lincoln, 
the black leader, I mean, who supported the black, when he became president, he was for bringing out the black emancipation bill. That means just like Gandhiji gave uh, the scheduled caste some very important uh, this thing. So also he was a black man and he was killed. He was a, he stood for the black cause. Therefore he was killed. And for the first 10 days, all the newspapers reported that he's been assassinated, he's been killed. But the New York Times, after 10 days, they brought out a, a, you know, headline saying this, Abraham Lincoln uh, martyr. Now that became a sort of thing for discussion. You know, it sparked off a lot of debate and discussion. And then, uh, you know, because that is where the uh, dying for the cause of the nation took, uh, say, or a social cause, you could say, deviating from the religion. So when uh, in India, it continued for a long time. It is only in 1928, I think, Veer Savarkar, he gave a slightly different definition. He, saw, he said martyrdom is related to Abrahamic uh, religions, you know, Christian and this thing, because somebody who doesn't believe in the faith. Now, those of you who are familiar with current affairs, recently you must have seen there was a girl who in Tamil Nadu, she committed suicide because uh, they forced her, <coughs> some Christian missionaries, some school, they forced her to change her faith. Now, she voluntarily gave up her, language, uh, her uh, life, uh, which is to say she committed suicide because she did not want to denounce her own faith. Now, that is martyrdom, according to the classic definition. But in popular practice and understanding, we don't consider that as martyrdom. Martyrdom is somebody who dies uh, by a bullet on the border or by a blast or a you know, very top leader is killed. I'm just trying to put this thing in, in, in perspective so that you understand the difference between uh, sacrifice for a cause of a religion, sacrifice for a cause, cause of the state. Now in martyrdom in India, mm, somehow has taken, uh, you know, the center stage of uh, Mahatma Gandhi's assassination. Because when 1948, he got assassinated, the looking for some kind of a word. And since he was on the same lines as Abraham Lincoln, who died for a particular cause, therefore he became a martyr. And then 30th January was to be observed as a martyr day. It was, uh, I mean, it, it spread very fast. And then subsequently, uh, in Hindi, or you can say in Urdu, they call it the Shahid, Shahid Divas, because there is no alternative word for it in Sanskrit. But uh, Veer Savarkar had called some of them, he called, uh, he, he was a Marathi, so he, he called it Putatma. Putatma is one who sacrificed his life. So you have in uh, Mumbai, the Hutatma Chow, which was clear, uh, previously the Flora fountain, even now a lot of old timers like me, we call it the flora fountain. So that is the Hutatma. Then some people called it Balita, Balidan Divas. Then some people were, uh, they call it Sadgati and so all equivalent terms which are there. But otherwise, martyrdom as a religious term does not find any, it does not figure any of the uh, Indian context. Uh, the, the normal activity on a martyr's day is the typically in India, you have the Rashtrapati, the Pradhan Mantri, and you know, all the cabinet ministers going on to uh, the Samadhi of Mahatma Gandhi, laying flowers, floral tributes. Then there is some bhajan, and, uh, <laughs> and everybody has a holiday, and that's the end of it. There's nothing more. Uh, and everything is focused on, and generally, Martyrdom is synonymous with Mahatma Gandhi's association. But, but whereas it goes much beyond that, we have the Indian soldiers. You can go on to the next slide. Uh, we have the Indian soldiers uh, 
we have who have sacrificed uh, in the first world war in the second world war and and also subsequently in uh, so many operations now this controversy started in uh, 2019 just before the second term for uh, the present government began and there was this balakot operation you all must have heard where the indian army uh, indian air force carried out a surgical strike and before that there was this pulwama uh, massacre in which 40 indian soldiers crpf soldiers were killed but now these were killed while they were the convoy uh, they were proceeding towards srinagar the they were not actually participating in an operation so as for the you know regulations manual they are not treated as uh, you can say battle casualties because battle casualties when you are fighting a battle but the insurgency uh, activities in um, jnk and other places is totally different irrespective how you when you are killed with an enemy bullet you are a martyr so the opposition took up a case saying that they all should be declared as martyrs and immediately the at that time the elections were due and there were a lot of political you know it's part of a very violent kind of a controversy and that is the time first time when bjp and few others came out with this thing of martyrdom that you know in the, because in the army manuals we don't have a thing like Martyred up. Even today, when somebody gets killed on the border, uh, some of these uh, TV channels they say so and so martyred, but the army doesn't. We we have only killed in battle or killed in operation. That's about all. This martyred up is is not there. So, uh, and uh, the logic is, how can an Indian soldier dying for a secular state be a martyr? Because when you ask as a secular Have any, uh, you know, the governance as the governance is concerned, the religion does not come in into the thing. So how can such a person be declared a martyr? Anyway, this, this is uh, just to put in the things in, in the perspective. We'll go on to the next one. This, you know, Sarojini Devi Naidu with uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Yeah, next. This is again uh, the thing. Now, national market day. We already, I already covered this. The significance uh, was he was killed for his political beliefs, thoughts, and activity, and not because of uh, the cause. He did not fight for the cause uh, to for any religion. Next, but here the point comes uh, more than uh, yeah. Now we have other martyrs day also. You know, because it started with that, but soon you have the Shahid Diwas when Shahid Bhagat Singh was hanged on 23rd March. Then there is a Bhasha Shahid Diwas because that is a federal kind of a you know political system. Each state has its own. So you find the moment like in Andhra, you have the political Pakti Sri Ramlu. He died because of some reason in Assam. Somebody died. 15 Bengali protesters were killed in Assam because uh, Assam government they said there will be only one state language, and Bengalis who who were in huge numbers they took to street and 15 were killed. So they brought out a Bhasha Tai Shahid Diwas that was on some 19th May. Then you have a police martyrs day 20th uh, October. Then you have Lala Rajput Rai when he was uh, You, you can say when he was killed, uh, that was on 17th November. Then 19th November, he is again Guru Gobind said. Then you have Mrs. Gandhi who was assassinated, and so on. So, uh, where what exactly is Martyr Day? We don't have a national a single Martyr Day when so many uh, the people have given their lives away. We'll go on to the next slide. You'll watch how many people. Are, Now this is the Indian soldiers who died in various wars. Uh, just a point of interest, statistical details. In World War One, we had uh, nearly about eighty thousand soldiers who died. Indian soldiers, British, who went abroad 
and in, they were in various areas in Africa, in Europe, and so many places. And uh, 80,000 died. There are about 20, 30,000 missing, about 50,000 who were wounded. But all those who died, there are more than 80,000. They're all, in a way, you, you can call, were they freedom fighters? Uh, I won't go into that because they were fighting for the British, and British had taken the thing. But all the same, they were Indians. Okay, in World War II, we have almost, we had almost similar number of past who, who, who died, you know, about uh, 70, 80,000. Then uh, we had 1948 operations. Soon after we got the independence, Pakistan, uh, the tribals attacked with 10,000 people. That was a JNK operation. Then we had 1962, the Chinese operation. Then in 1971 operation, we had uh, in East Pakistan for liberation of uh, Bangladesh, uh, in which I had uh, the, uh, the privilege to participate in 71 war. Then we had 1999, the Kargil operation. And apart from these four or five operations, we also have had and still going on with this counterinsurgency operations in the Northeast. Northeast, you have Mizoram, Nagaland, and there was secessionist movement in the early 50s, 60s. Then 70s, 80s, there too I was there in Mizoram and in Nagaland and these areas. And we have seen the counterinsurgency operations are still going on. It still goes on in JNK and you have every day few officers, few men dying. Now, uh, there is no particular day for this because 30th uh, January is taken for Mahatma Gandhi as a martyr's day and we celebrate it. Nobody wants to meddle with the system because politically it may not be very uh, expedient. Uh, so uh, I had suggested some time back saying that we must have one Martyr's Day in which every Indian who has uh, who's been killed, you know, for uh, upholding the national, you know, for, for those who fought for the freedom and those who are still fighting to uphold the sovereignty and the integrity of the nation should be uh, sort of, uh, it, it's not a celebration, it is more of an observance of the day. A lot of people, they say, okay, 30th, we, we celebrate. We don't celebrate anything. We just observe it as a solemn day and remember all those people. Okay. Now, uh, you, you people are very uh, fortunate, those of you who are in Delhi, this is a new thing. I saw it when it was halfway, it was coming up. I was also a party to that when we were initially planning this thing. And uh, it's a beautiful monument. I've seen the one similar one in the US. It is, uh, that's a little different, but I think this uh, any day is far, far uh, superior to the one I've seen in Vietnam or even here or in a, any other country. I think it's one of the world's best memorials we have. Uh, I have in this the Ashok Chakra winner of my successor. I was commanding a battalion soon after I left in Nagaland. His, uh, he was ambushed and he died with 30 of his men. And his name is there. He got an Ashok Chakra. And uh, he's, uh, he had previously got a Kirti Chakra also. We were colleagues in Mizoram, a very brave soldier, Colonel N.J. Nair from the Maratha Regiment. Okay, we'll go on to the next one. Yeah, the one on the left is the National Defense Academy. That's my alma mater. Like you all feel very proud of Sri Venkateshwara College. This is the National Defense Academy. They have a war memorial hut. Now they improved on this. And then on the right, you have the Kargil War Memorial. Now, these are all memorials are important to sort of inspire the younger generation and those who, you know, voluntarily uh, sort of like to join the army and they get motivated and this is how the younger generation keeps coming. You go, next one. A freedom moment of it. I think I have another about five, ten minutes. I'll uh, briefly cover this freedom moment in the Northeast. I, enough, we all know enough about what's uh, on the mm, mainstream India, 
but very little is known about the northeast i have served in northeast for very long time in i just returned uh, about 15 20 days back you know i had launched a new book uh, you know is my fourth book it is the anglo fuki war it's a uh, it's uh, uh, i had gone there because this the fuki community had invited me for the launch of this book i had done a little bit of research it took me almost one and a half two years it was easy for me because i have served in those areas and i could easily emotionally connect with them and uh, so i'll cover a little bit of that and also few unsung heroes of northeast uh, the contribution of northeast people has generally generally been overlooked uh, the reason is simple because uh, this these are very interior areas hills jungles very poor communication and uh, even today but for the last about 5 6 years there have been a phenomenal changes going on there and it is our north is it is called that uh, you know isha kona it is supposed to be a very very sacred for the everything starts from there but uh, you know since our independence all concentration has been on the western side mumbai uh, your karnataka your uh, gujarat you know all if if you draw a central line with india east of it has always been a little slow for development and as you keep going you have this narrow siliguri corridor which is just about 10 12 kilometers or 15 kilometers long stretch and that is the only funneling uh, through which you are connected with north east earlier they were called seven sisters now you have buta uh, sikkim also as part of it so after lakshmi some people call it so these are these eight states which have never found a place in the sun they have done a lot of uh, you know sacrifices so this anglo fuki war a book which i have recently written uh, your doctor the wife he is uh, he belongs to this uh, very illustrious community the tribe uh, and uh, wonderful people those of you who get an opportunity <coughs> must go to manipur and visit some of these places there is the indian national army uh, war memorial and uh, the cookies uh, the fort uh, against the britishers you know it is just to keep up their just to maintain their dignity preserve their dignity and honor and then subsequently when the japanese attacked uh, the british army indian army was also there a lot of cookies they helped the they joined the indian national army and they acted as guide raiders recently i had the privilege of meeting uh, an old man who was 180 years old and his uh, mental and physical faculties are absolutely intact hearing you know that i spent a little time with him and then he had met subhash chandra bose he had physically you know shaken his hands with him and then he had japanese he had a lot of things to show unfortunately even among the kuki community very few people knew about him and i spoke about him during the tv and in the papers and all then i am told some people went and saw him so he is one of the last uh, remnants of this anglo kuki war although he was only 5 6 years old at that time but uh, he heard a lot of stories from his father and his parents and his friends and all that so there is a lot of uh, stories i'll talk uh, briefly about this a little later before that i'll come to few unsung heroes of northeast we'll go one by one first of all assam the first chief minister of assam was uh, borderline you know gopinath borderline uh, the he was a great freedom fighter and uh, he had joined the, the gandhi ji's movement and the dandi march and all i think he was born uh, sometime in the late uh, he was 1890 or something at the time of uh, india's independence he was about 57 years old uh, 
why a lot of credit is given to him is uh, but for him assam would have uh, ceded to east pakistan it would have gone to east pakistan uh, assam uh, most of assam would have become part of east pakistan but he fought for it and then he became very popular he was called lokpriya and uh, the present airport at gawati the international airport is named after him every time i go there i saw this uh, i see this is beautiful airport uh, see uh, gopinath it's called loknai gopinath bodalai airport and uh, he he also was responsible for mitigating the sufferings of millions of refugees who came from uh, at that time you know both side both punjab and uh, bengal there were a lot of partition moment at a cross moment hindus and uh, muslims massacring each other but in assam he minimized the thing and is known for that and we have uh, my favorite major fauna but we uh, Gajabashi. Now he was born in sometime in uh, I, I think 1830. This thing he was uh, in the service of the Manipur uh, kingdom. Uh, some of you may know that Manipur kingdom was one of those kingdoms which was there for almost of a thousand years in continuation. In continuation, you know, there was no break in that dynasty, and uh, he had joined as a or very soldier but went on to become a major which was a very big rank during those days and he was a senapati and when the british tried to capture the manipur kingdom it was a princely state and he was there in the forefront he led the army and the, but the british because of their superiority and modern weapons they could capture him and after he was captured he was given an option they were so impressed with it that they said uh, that they promised him we'll give you a very important post and all the honor you switch over to our army and when they insisted he took out his hair band there was a, a cloth band round his head turban he took it out and you said you can behead me but i'll not be disloyal to my king and my army and my state and uh, there was a trial carried out and he was hanged so he is the jona bigbashi he was at that time just around about 50 53 years old then we we have this rajkumar bir sikandar singh now he, he is the one you can see on the left which is the first photograph which is in black and white then we have uh, rani jaydin lu you must have recently you know after modi government came to power she has been in lot of in news she belonged to the of uh, the naga tribe uh, the, one of the naga tribe and as a very young girl she tried to um, you know integrate all the naga tribe and make them uh, make them give up you know those some of those uh, superstitions and you know they everybody had their own um, tradition so she wanted to have some kind of a, a standard uh, thing she fought for that and it became very popular and it became a political moment once it has assumed a political color then she started pressuring the british to give up tax reforms and you know she was also known for carrying out some guerrilla raids and you know against uh, so she was uh, arrested and uh, she she's another great figure recently in manipur just on the nagaland border there is a train it the first train which has come just think just two days back the station is named after her those of you who are interested you can just log into that uh, google and go into that then you have uh, uh, rajkumar the the tikendrajit singh tikendrajit singh was the son of uh, the manipur he, he was one of the prince of manipur a young prince just about 25 years old when the british attack in the april of uh, 90, 1891 and he fought 
the british suddenly came with 400 gurkhas and they stormed the palace and kulchandra to hand him over you the, uh, the one of the princes uh, they refused and uh, the king beheaded five english officers so in anger next next year they came up with a big force they captured him and then they hanged him so he is one of the things now these are all the great people then you have uh, yukyang nangba and uh, the other is the patogar sangma now both uh, one of them belong to the garo hills and the other belong to the you know there's uh, the both are from uh, meghalaya yeah Now both these people are from Meghalaya. This was way back, more than 150 years old, before around the Indian Mutiny time, and you know they carried out a lot of raid, guerrilla activities against the against the Britishers because the Shillong till then had not been destroyed. It was it was not part of uh, it was a little separate, and then the moment when the Britishers went, they tried to uh, oppose. the british hegemony in that area now these are some of the thing i'll just briefly touch upon the anglo kuki war now the anglo kuki war is a uh, yeah is you, you can keep this slide on the no problem now the anglo kuki war is uh, what was uh, the one of the um, uh, most violent and fiercest battles that so after uh, 1857 uh, the war of independence or what the britishers called it the indian mutiny the britishers called it indian mutiny and i think in recent years it has been changed to the first war of independence i i i i can say because i wrote a book on this i did a lot of research there, there is no other you know state in india a princely state which rebelled and fought like this Uh, the way the cookies fought now to understand a little bit of cookies if you they are part of uh, manipur and manipur is a huge valley the huge valley with a ring of hills all around the people in the valley are called the maithe who follow vaishnavism or hindus basically and the people on the hill they are all this tribal and one of them was the cookie tribe who were the main uh, so i guess we lost the internet connection from your side sir am i audible to you uh, harsh he will be joining Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. And I'm, I'm sorry, the power went off for a short while. I got disconnected. So uh, I, I was saying uh, the the British, uh, the Germans were using France after having captured it uh, to use as a springboard to attack uh, Britain. Britain was at that time a uh, global power. They were all over the world. and india was one of the largest uh, sort of money spinners for them both in terms of human resources and also economy 
and they wanted about 50,000 porters, you know, to do up the infrastructure of France because if France had gone, Britain would have gone. So France was the last bastion as far as Britain Britain was concerned. So they wanted uh, men for uh, infrastructure build up, like you know, your road, low road, airports, ports, and railways, and so on. You know, that's the thing. And India gave the largest number, about fifty thousand. They wanted them, so they were taken from all over the country. And Manipur government was asked to give over two thousand labourers. The king had promised. So all the local tribals had recruited themselves voluntarily in the Mizoram and the Nagas and all. But uh, the Kukis was one very proud race. They refused to go as labour. They said we are basically warriors. We don't do any of this work. That is one of the reasons, but there are so many other reasons, uh, and they refused to go. Now that was not taken very kindly by the British administration, and they tried to bring in a lot of punitive actions against them. And the moment that happened, the the Cookies were not a single community; they were sub tribes, about forty, fifty of them. Each one of them had their own thing, uh, you know, their own leaders, chieftains. They all got together. But they have very strong tradition. They all got together and waged the war against the British. And they waged the war against the powerful might of the British army for two years. They fought. It is not easy to fight the war for two years. They had very limited resources. But in the end, they gave up only because the Britishers resorted to some very unethical uh, measures like burning of the villages. And holding the children and old women to ransom. When this happened, <laughs> the chieftains had to surrender. And even after the surrender, they, they they carried out a lot of trials. And some of them, you know, they sent them for life imprisonment and all. And they disintegrated them in such a way they could never assemble together. It's a great story. It's a good book. Uh, I, I'm not saying for the average minute. I'm only saying about the content. It's a very good topic. It's very nice. I could talk to a lot of peasants, scholars, uh, you know, so many students, uh, housewives, and uh, the businessmen all over. Thing. And it was well received. Uh, I would suggest those of you who have interest read the book. I will send that, uh, you know, that uh, the flyer thing. But I think in, a, in any case, your doctor has welfare has got a. A copy he has ordered that, and I feel your library should get uh, at least one or two books for the people to know because you should know about Northeast. Northeast has done a lot of sacrifice. I'm a member of Northeast uh, Indian History Association life member. I go every year for you know submitting an article and all. And since I have served there for fairly long long time, uh, I understand. Uh, You know, I understand the, the spirit of North. You know, the people of Northeast. Now we are getting the lot of Axis Asia policy of the Indian government, and ultimately we're going to be connected through and through to Thailand and right up to Vietnam. I've been up to Vietnam to cover some in the the U.S. Vietnam War thing and all. Uh, so Northeast is coming. So your future lies there. Those of who in the last five ten years, those of you. Uh, Still young, so I, I don't have anything more to say. It was just a very general kind of a talk. I think I heard, I hope I have not taken too time, uh, too much time. In case any of you have got any questions, I'll uh, be I'll try and answer. Happy to take them. Thank you. All give it some. but some gave it all thank you so much sir for enlightening us about the spirit of northeast and about the real meaning of martyrdom that was indeed a very thoughtful and insightful session we are indeed blessed to have you with us today i express my thanks to you sir for taking time out from your busy schedule and to be the guest speaker at our event today uh, now let's move on to the interactive question and answer session it would not be possible to answer all the questions by our audience due to paucity of time so our team has already selected some among the best ones i invite you sir to answer these questions 
sir the first question is today martyred soldiers do receive nationwide support but that often lasts until a few days of martyrdom post which the fire extinguishes sir to an extent a couple of recent reports cite the rise of severe stress and borderline depression amongst the defense forces how do you suggest it could be tackled uh the first of all i uh, i fully agree with your sentiment you people are the future you are the young generation and uh, i joined nda you know when i was just out of school i was hardly 16 then and then since then i have been uniform and of course subsequently and i have seen the march of events for the last about 40 50 years a lot of changes have taken place indian army has become very modern and even in the first world second world war we have very very primitive kind of uh, equipment till 1962 when uh, we had a sort of backlash with the chinese but in the recent years there are a lot of changes taking place that is because i think uh, mainly because of a little media exposure and also Uh, we are we now have a good leadership without getting to political i can say that we have a good leadership there is a, lo- a lot of pride because when i travel abroad the thing earlier you know one always hesitated we went a lot of people didn't even know we existed but today the people do take uh, you know the notice of you and i don't have much the government is always trying to do something but there is always uh, political parties and there are always some people pulling down that is the first part of the question what is the second part it was very interesting that i would like to sir so the second part was about the rising uh, uh, stress and yeah, borderline yeah. depression yeah now this borderline depression i don't give much of uh, thing to this i think that today because you know at my age sometimes i go and visit my old cooks and all you know this thing i think the morale is very high they we are very educated young people socially they are well connected you know everybody has got a mobile and they know what is happening i was surprised when my when i joined my unit uh, my rifle man who was with me he was just about second class or third class but i went for my golden jubilee two years back and then my i have from the intelligence section a chap who is a pretech from pune I told him you can get such a lovely job in US. What are you doing here? He says, "Sir, I love this job." So today, and secondly, the Indian soldier is different. I did a little bit of uh, studies about this uh, syndrome, about you know this depression and all in US for those Vietnam uh, veterans who had come back and you know this thing and all. I don't think as for the Indian soldier is very tough. The reason is very simple. our soldiers are more spiritual than anyway you know because we come from home from very traditional homes where we we have a very strong uh, you know that religious and spiritual background so anybody who's got a spiritual background take it from me he can never uh, undergo a depression because then everything you know he he understand the the whole essence of our uh, indian spirituality and we all, we have regularly in the army even in siachen even in the testing we have a small monday where every day in the evening the soldiers get a little time to the take them you know i don't know take more time this is a huge subject yeah yes sir i also India. do believe that josh is always high in the line of duty so before we move on to the next question there's a lot of requests coming in from the audience to inquiring about the name of your book can you please uh, just state the name of your book yeah yeah i'll just uh, send the uh, there's a flyer in my whatsapp just give me a a minute in the meanwhile if anybody has got any views on whatever i said you, you can just uh, share that yes sir. Yes, sir. then after you do so we'll move on to the next question yeah i think doctor doctor wifi you have the my, my player yeah i i i got it i just
your number is 8074 shivam who whatever is i don't know yes sir yes sir yes sir yeah yeah okay send the this thing just have a look at it if you have received you can just flash it on to the screen and then it is there available on amazon but those who want hard copies uh, you can take it from one there is dr haukit who the the professor is in uh, dl haukit who is a professor is in gauhati university i'm sure dr haukam wife i may be knowing him otherwise i'll connect you to him he knows about you i told him about you. and then because he is not all there i got the cheese printed i never expected that so many books would sell and you know and it all got exhausted there so he's got about 40 50 copies i'm sure you can order or not yeah thank you so much yeah. sir we've received the flyer yeah. yes sir we'll yeah. circulate it with our audience yeah. sir now let's move and on sir, to the next question okay next one. please go yeah. go sorry so you talked about the anglo kuki war uh, so could you enlighten us about the role of women in this war and how did they put up a fight with the colonizers we yeah, are a good question mm, you know we are talking about uh, about 103 years 104 years i think it was a tribal uh, community and uh, very very traditional and they made very clear distinction between the duties of the men and duties of the women and like even in the indian context so I, at that time they did not get uh, they did not have but they participated in a way in a passive way in the sense uh, the kuki warriors moved from one village to another they did not have an organized army they did not have a structural army they did not have supply departments they did not have any of these things and uh, but they could any cookie even today the tradition is any cookie can go into any house just walk in sleep there have his food and go on so that tradition held them in great uh, you know it came as a great help because the warriors were moving from village to village the cookie women they took the food uh, and where who ever became uh, injured they nursed them and they gave them all the uh, sort of help that was required for these warriors Uh, so the warrior doesn't didn't have to carry his sword and worry uh, what is going to happen to me after two three days. Wherever he went uh, into the village, the women did a lot of support and the men were fighting. So unlike in other places, I would say the Kuki men and women they shared uh, the you know travels of uh, the privations of this war. So uh, in a way, they, they didn't have to carry the arms and fight, but the logistic support. and the backbone of this community with women thank you for answering that question sir so the next question is can the deaths in the forces caused due to technical faults or other related accidents that could very well be a civilian's ill fate be characterized as martyrdom as it was recently ruled out by a few newspapers this is in context to the uh, our honorable general bipin rawat's death yeah now this is a, a very highly debatable uh, sort of question i can give you any number of instances the for instance uh, of a person normally martyrdom is always considered that i am fighting i am going into an attack and the enemy defender is sitting uses medium machine guns and unless he pumps in a couple of bullets into my thing i'm smart it's not that anybody who is in the line of duty cause of duty sometimes it happens even a muleteer a muleteer is the one who is carrying a mule i mean who is uh, taking the mule who is laden with ammunition and gun and sometimes he slips and falls off no he is not died because of a gun injury or bullet injury or something he is also or a person who the moment the battle area has started is traveling his vehicle meets with an accident 20 people died uh, died because of it goes down into the flood of 3000 feet they are all warrior anybody who is in the line of so general uh, uh, cds now somehow we try and make it political i think uh, from the soldier's point of view Mm, 
all this war the planning takes place in uh, in peace so he is also contributing it's not that one has to carry his pitu and take his gun and then go and fight only this thing anybody who's doing i think it should be considered a martyr not i would not say a martyr he is uh, uh, you can't say he is killed in action or killed in battle but then he is uh, see there are two aspects to it one is the financial aspect is from he is you know he gets his next of kin his family gets you know for the next 10 20 years or if a person has just died earlier they would get nothing because he did not die while on duty he died while he was on leave so there are a lot of, this is very very uh, i mean complicated this thing here but broadly speaking he was flying in a um, military helicopter he was going for something very very important top college wellington you know where our middle level officers are trained they are all the future generals and he was going for something very important and a thing like that when he and he he was not on a holiday he was there along with his entire uh, advisors and all those things and even his wife was the president of awa that is army welfare association she was also going for a purpose she is entitled to it as for the thing and so i think uh, it's it's very much in line yes sir sir there is another question uh why anglo kuki war is not as famous as other wars like indo pak wars and indo china wars yeah first of all anglo kuki war was uh, the british tried to completely suppress it uh, you will be surprised the anglo kuki war started sometime in 1970 in march some people say it is in october but the, you know the earlier the thing in the army there never one date when it starts it always starts with small little skirmishes then it goes on then it build up then one fine day so it, it started in 1917 and for about 6 months no newspaper reported it at that time the press was not very only the british press had uh, control not one the earliest it came into into limelight was in 2018 almost 6 months one paper in calcutta reported a little about it. the british were afraid that this may trigger uh, you know more uh, sort of such rebellion at all british called it a rebellion but the kuki is they called it a war then because kuki said we don't come under you we are not under your jurisdiction rebellion is within but this was somewhere outside about that i have written a book and with lot of the kuki's uh, feel they vindicate they feel vindicated that their stand has been upheld with this book so uh, the reason was simple indo pak wars and all these were post independence so whatever we do we the thing but this was that like rani jhansi lakshmi bai it's, it's a very famous thing everybody knows how the queen of jhansi she rebelled against the yes they are again called it a rebellion but it was a, a kind of war and this happened about 120 years nobody knew about it during one of my two years back when i was asked to write some articles since i was there i seen kuki is fighting in assam rifles and so other i got interested when i did a little research i found that there's a lot of there's already enough literature available on that i'm not the first one to write but i am the first one to write about the military aspects of it's a military perspective of and of the war okay sir sir on a different note how in your perspective country should handle jingoism or hyper nationalism being used for political narratives i really don't know because as a politician i'm not a politician all that is is just ignore you know because uh, the today social media cuts both ways while it uh, informs it also misleads i have seen some very very mature senior people also we get so excited when we see earlier we were only worried about uh, um, offline i'm talking about we are only worried about our families a job evening once in a month movie and a little bit of doordarshan this and that but ever since this uh, mass this mass media has, has come in social networking side 
everybody has become expert in everything you know we 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 take on the doctors on pandemic how it should be treated then there is a person who never seen a rifle he'll take he'll tell the defense of how it should be what should be fought and all that so uh, social media thing is both a weapon as well as a, it's a double edged weapon you can use it for the good but you can also use it i think awareness there's, there's nothing you you all the young people you all, you know better you can do nothing about uh, controlling the media all that is a little bit of awareness and bit a bit of national spirit see now you know the elections in up are going on you know the idea nobody talks about uh, the development issue it's it's mainly of religion and caste and he so on so they should he should be with us or he so on so we vote against him. you know these are the issues which are taking the thing and uh, all this agitation which are taking blocking roads and you know common agitation and all we should be a little there is a thing called gray zone warfare i'm doing a little research into that gray zone warfare is the changing the perceptions of the people you don't even know what is what is it is artificial intelligence and all so all that you do is be aware that's what all i can say i think uh, some of you should do research into this yeah Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for answering all these questions. Sir, we would love to have your final remarks. Uh, yeah, my final take uh, on this is uh, every day to me is a kind of market day in the sense. every day you open a thing you find in jnk somebody is dying so let it not be personality oriented i have got a very high regard for mahatma gandhi he is a very great and he should not be brought in in any of these and saying that 30th is a martyr day therefore we observe and there it is i think every day our soldiers are dying you see it's heart wrenching when you see the families and young children and all that thing and every day including the civilian anyone who has given up anyone who sacrifices the country it is not for sacrificing for his religion but any one who is sacrificing for the nation uh, should be respected and uh, there should be one national day it is a, which is a martyr day on this irrespective of caste color creed which regiment who who is there we should observe that and Uh, that's about all and before i uh, sort of uh, sign off i would like to thank your uh, principal again and your study ma'am uh, dr deepika singh ji and all you wonderful children for having the patience to listen to me i don't know it was just off the cuff kind of a thing on the heart i just uh, it was not a very prepared text i only prepared the ppt so that i don't lose out the parts i thank each one of the each one of you and uh, i know how important it is the diamond jubilee thing is such a landmark you people are very fortunate to be there at this time of uh, you know the event in history of your college and Manchester University has got a very high reputation. I remember one of my colleagues in the early 80s who wanted his daughter to get admitted. She was not very keen at that time to go to she. She wanted to go to something more, you know, glamorous kind of a college. But then later on, she got into IS and you know went abroad and all. So it's an excellent institution. I wish you all the best. God bless you all and thank you. Namaskar. Thank you so much, sir, for your blessings. I'm sure we have a lot to take away from this session. उड़ जाती है नींद यह सोच कर कि सरहद पे दी गई वो कुर्बानियाँ मेरी नींद के लिए ही थी. Now I would like to invite Dr. Howcom Wi-Fi sir to officially give a vote of thanks.
Good afternoon, everyone present here. It is such an honor for me to get the opportunity to thank everyone on behalf of the Department of Political Science, Sri Vinkateswar College. I would like to express my gratitude to all the participants for your presence and contribution to making this webinar a great success. I extend my gratitude to our speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Colonel Dr. Vijay Chenji, to take out time for his busy schedule to grasp the event. Thank you for inspiring, enlightening, and encouraging us with your words on this important day. Very much thought-provoking, intellectual indeed, put for thought for all of us. Thank you for highlighting the contributions made by the Nordic Freedom Fighters. It is phenomenal. We have learned a lot from your lecture and also discussion. We will stay connected to you. Big thank you, sir. And special thanks to Professor C. Sila Reddy, Principal, for providing immense support to make this webinar successful. I also extend my gratitude to Dr. Zita Misra, teacher in charge of the department, to organize a webinar even amidst the pandemic. We continue on and on. And I must thank the organizing team, Dr. Deepika Ma'am, co-convener of the webinar, and also her team, and also Political Science Association President, Mr. Uh, Sivam Kumar and his team for working hard for the past few days to make this webinar successful. And also I thank uh, the host today, Harsh Vardhan, for making the program very lively and also very much um, successful. I also thank the teachers, students of the department and non-teaching staff of the college for helping us make this webinar a success. Thank you everyone once again for making it a grand success. Lastly today, we pay homage to all the greats who courageously safeguarded our nation in their service and bravery will always be remembered. Thank you everyone. Thank you, sir. Now I request everyone to turn on their videos for a group photograph. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. With that, we have now come to the end of this session. I once again thank everyone for joining this wonderful session. I wish you all a cheerful day ahead.